This is the ninth in a series of lectures giving an introduction to exterior differential systems. In this lecture, we'd like to reconsider the work we did in the last lecture, but from the perspective of tableau. In the last lecture, we explained why it is that the predicted dimension in, Cart in the cartan kähler theorem should be what, what it is. In other words, that it should be the condition under which we would be able to carry out Carton strategy. Carton strategy constructs integral manifolds dimension at a time, and at least uh, assumes or hopes that the integral manifolds at achieved, at least generically, at each step will lie inside one of the, of the next dimension. So in order that that succeeds, we felt that it would be reasonable that the generic integral element of each given dimension should arise in an integral element of the next dimension uh, all the way up. And um, that uh, condition turned out to be exactly the condition of involution. We'd like to see that from the tableau perspective, why it is that there's some reason in the, in the nature of the tableau why the predicted dimension of integral elements should come out the way, the way it does. So let's count integral elements again, but now using a tableau, or count dimensions of integral elements using a tableau. Let's start with an integral element. That's something of, uh, of, of an, a hypothesis, of course, the existence of an integral element, but we're principally interested in volutive systems where the integral elements will, have, uh, will be of expected dimension, and so the existence of an integral element is, is already a reasonable hypothesis. We'll pick a tableau adapted to that particular integral element. So this tableau should consist of some, some differential forms arranged in some matrix, and the, um, the integral element should be expressed in terms of, so our, so our forms are some thetas, omegas, pi's. That integral element we started with should be expressed by setting the thetas and pi's to zero. And the omegas will be linearly independent on it. Now let's look at our tableau and, and suppose that we had, um, we had various polars, which we'll call pi alphas, and they sit in the various grades in the tableau. Gather up the ones that sit in grade i and call them pi i. So pi i is a column vector. Its entries are one forms, polar one forms. They're polars that arise in our, in our uh, tableau for our exterior differential system. Pi 1 consists of all the polars of grade 1 written down in a column and so on and so forth. Okay, so now we've got these, these columns of polars and we want to write our integral elements. I want to say that all the integral elements near the given one look like setting pi to be p omega for some coefficients, p's. Why is that? Well, the integral element we started with um, was, uh, was then adapted to our tableau, or our tableau was adapted to it. In other words, our tableau uh, has that integral element written as, p as pi equals zero. So every nearby integral element, the omegas will still be linearly dependent on it, It'll still have thetas equal to zero, and it'll have pi's equal to something, some multiples of the omegas, because the omegas will still be linearly independent. So all nearby integral elements must be expressible somehow by setting the pi's to be some coefficients p's times the omegas. But those coefficients aren't arbitrary, those p's, those pi's. They have to satisfy some equations in order that that, that particular um, subspace the, of the tangent space is actually an integral element. So we want to dig out those equations among the pi-j's. We'll def assign a grade to each pi-j. Um, so pi-i consists of all the polars of grade i. So we can think of i as having a grade, as being a grade. Um, and the omegas are graded, omega 1, omega 2, and so on. Grade uh, of omega j is j. And the grade of a coefficient pij will be the difference i minus j. And that'll be convenient for what we want to do uh, when we count out these various uh, the equations among these p's. So for the moment, let's forget about nonlinearity. Nonlinearity is a bit confusing. It's easier to imagine a, a system where, there's no, where there are no nonlinearities. Assume the nonlinearity is zero, and that covers a lot of interesting cases. And we'll worry later about what to do when there's some nonlinearity. So assume that there's no nonlinearity. Um, in other words, that there are no pi wedge pi terms, or pi wedge pi wedge pi terms, and so on and so forth. Each pi appears only wedged with some omegas and doesn't appear 
wedged with any other pi's. We know that our torsion is zero at the particular integral element we've chosen. Uh, we can also assume that it's zero nearby. In other words, that the uh, that that setting the pi's to zero will give us um, integral elements at every nearby point. That's safe to assume because we can assume there are at least some integral elements nearby, and then we can adapt the pi's suitably to make sure that they have uh, the, that that those integral elements are expressed with no torsion. Let's plug the pi's equal to some multiples of the omegas into the tableau. We don't know what these coefficients p, i, j have to satisfy, so we want to see that happen. We want to see them expand out and give us some equations for integral elements. So we plug into the pi's, or p's times the omegas, into our tableau. Everywhere we see one of the pi's, we, we plug in the suitable p's times omegas multiples. We expand everything out and see what happens. We get linear equations only on the pi-j's. The reason they're linear is, again, because there's no nonlinearity. We've assumed there's no nonlinearity, no pi which pi terms. So each pi is only wedged with the various omegas. And so when you plug in that, that pi is p times omegas, we get some linear equation on the p's. Uh, so these are pure linear equations, and they're, they vanish when the p's are zero because of the vanishing torsion. And so we can assume that, in fact, they're purely linear equations on p, each pi-j. Let's see if we can expand out and find some of those, maybe not all, but some of those linear equations. Let's solve for all the negative grade pi-j's in terms of the semi-positive grade ones. What does semi-positive mean? Semi-positive is a word I use to mean not negative, to avoid using a double negative, because double negatives in speech and writing are confusing. So it's better, in my experience, to te when teaching to say semi-positive instead of non-negative. Um, okay, so we're going to solve for all the negative grade pi-j's with i less than j, in other words. In terms of the semi-positive grades, that's that's with i bigger than or equal to j. We want to solve uh, those linear equations. How do we see that there is a non-trivial linear equation for each negative grade pi-j in terms of semi-positive grade coefficients? So why is there such an equation? Look at how, it, how that pi-j omega j arises. It pops up in grade j, in, sorry, in grade i. It pops up in grade i because it's one of the coefficients of the pi i's, the polar's pi i. So it pops up somewhere in grade i. What does grade i look like? It's some pi, some polar, wedged with omegas. Maybe it does. Maybe it's not wedged with omega one. And maybe it is. Maybe it's not wedged with omega two. Maybe it is. But it's certainly wedged with omega i. Okay, it's wedged with forms omega something, omega something, omega something, and so on and so forth, all the way up to omega i. It's certainly wedged with omega i, and that's it. It's not wedged with anything more. There's nothing after omega i that it's wedged with. So if j is bigger than i, when we wedge omega j with omegas 1 to i, we get a non-zero uh, entry. We get a non-zero differential form. Uh, so you don't get any cancellation. All right, so the terms p, i, j, omega j, will appear in grade i, and if j is bigger than i, we'll uh, find them that they wedge out when we expand everything out with forms that are never bigger than omega i, and we'll have an omega j, which j is bigger than i, so that term won't cancel. So we get non-canceling terms for every negative grade pij. Every negative grade coefficient appears non-trivially. Now, we have to think about what else appears in that in that equation. If you think about it for a bit, I'll leave you to worry about the details. You can convince yourself that it, you're able to solve for that pij of negative grade in terms of various other pi prime j primes, which might still be negative grade or might be semi-positive grade, but will be at least higher grade. So you can solve for each pij of negative grade in terms of coefficients of higher grade, possibly still negative, but higher. By induction, on the grade, we can ensure that all the negative grades are solved for in terms of higher and higher and higher grades until eventually they're solved for in terms purely of the semi-positive grades. So that's how we come up with linear equations that solve for all the negative grade coefficients, pij, in terms of semi-positive grade coefficients. Those are all linear equations in the pij's. Let's count them. We want to count how many negative grade coefficients there are, and that'll count how many equations we have. Let's see, what did we solve for? We solved for, for example, p 
P1i, i equals 2 to 3 and so on up to P, right? because that's negative grade. It's negative grade because its upper index, 1, is smaller than its lower index, i is 2, 3, and so on. So that means there are P minus 1 possible choices for that coefficient i, P minus 1 of those. But how many uh, actual coefficients are we looking at because P1i is actually a column of coefficients. Remember, that solves for pi 1 in terms of the omegas. And pi 1 is a column vector whose entries are the various pi's in grade 1. So we solve for P1i for i from 2 to p, so p minus 1 possible choices of i. And we solve for them occurring for all the polars in grade 1. There are S1 polars in grade 1. That's the character. The characters are S1, S2, and so on, counting the number of polars in grade 1, grade 2, and so on. And so we solved for these P1i's. Uh, there are S1 uh, and entries in that column vector P1i, and um, we solved it for i from 2 to p. So it's p minus 1 uh, choices of, of coefficient i, and then S1 choices of which entry we're looking at as we look down the column. Similarly, P2i, i runs from 3 to p, because i has to be bigger than, or e bigger than 2 um, to make a negative grade coefficient, and so on and so forth. Right. So ultimately, when we add them all up, we find that we've got P minus 1, S1, P minus 2, S2, and so on and so forth, all the way up to S, P minus 1, negative grade coefficients. That's how many negative grade Pij's there are. How many Pij's are there in all? There are P uh, possible choices of lower subscript. And uh, the number of upper subscript coefficient of possibilities is, um, is going to be S1 plus dot 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 plus SP because there's a Pij coefficient for every uh, polar and for every choice of uh, J going from 1 to P. So there are this many coefficients in total, Pij. And we found how many negative grade coefficients there are and how many there are in total. And so we subtract them and we get the semi-positive grade. We count out that there are this many free variables, this many semi-positive grade Pij coefficients. So we've got a number of Pij coefficients equal to S1 plus 2S2 plus dot 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 plus PSP. And that looks a lot like the predicted dimension. It's not quite the predicted dimension, but there are those at each point of our manifold M, that many choices of free Pij variables that the semi-positive grade ones, at each point of M. And so if we add dimension of M to that, we get the, the dimension of uh, the space of solutions of all of those equations for the Pij's. So that gives us a predicted dimension. Um, it gives us that the predicted dimension of integral elements is exactly the dimension of integral elements if and only if, once we've solved for the negative grade coefficients Pij, as functions of the semi-positive grade, that's all we can do. The semi-positives are arbitrarily variable. Um, the semi-positives take on arbitrary values. So predicted dimension occurs just when the negative grade Pij coefficients are functions of arbitrary semi-positive grade Pij coefficients. It's the arbitrariness that's important here. Because we know we can always, whether the system is involutive or not, we can always write the negative grade as functions of the semi-positive grade. But are the semi-positive grade arbitrary? If the semi-positive Pij coefficients are arbitrary, taken arbitrary values, then the space of integral elements achieves predicted dimension and vice versa. OK, so that explains why the um, predicted dimension of integral elements is exactly the one from the cartan kähler theorem, because it's given by solving for negative grade in terms of semi-positive grade, and then hoping that there are no further conditions on the semi-positive grade coefficients. Now, we've assumed that there, our system had no nonlinearity, that the nonlinearity vanished. But what if there was nonlinearity? Each nonlinear term, that's a pi which pi or a pi which pi which pi and so on, it becomes a quadratic or higher order in the Pij's. 
Why is that? Because each pi becomes a p times omega. And so if we have a pi wedge pi, that becomes quadratic in the p's. A pi wedge pi wedge pi becomes cubic in the p's, and so on and so forth. So we take the equations we had, which were purely linear equations in the various pi_js, the various coefficients, and we add on to them nonlinear terms. And we may in, in, uh, as well add some additional equations, which are purely nonlinear terms. So that messes up the, the count. But how does it mess up the count? We can describe the implicit function theorem as saying that a nonlinear system of equations imposes at least as many equations as its linear approximation. Roughly speaking, that's the right idea. So if you have some nonlinear equations in the pijs, and you want to know how many independent equations there are, well, there are at least as many as there are independent linear approximations to those equations when we linearize the system around p equals 0. And there may be, in addition, some more equations which cut down that space of solutions even further. So by the implicit function theorem, we can say that um, the nonlinear the, 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 the non uh, terms only slightly perturb the picture in the sense that we, that we still, at least locally, can solve for the negative grade pijs in terms of semi-positive grade ones. But there may be additional equations on the semi-positive grade ones, which was a situation we already had to face. And those equations could now perhaps also be nonlinear equations. So by the implicit function theorem, the fundamentals of the story don't really change when we pass from a linear system to a nonlinear system. OK, so putting it all together, what we found is there are equations for the pi greater than i is the negative grade. Negative grade because the grade is the difference between the superscript and the subscript. So pi greater than i makes it negative grade. We can solve for all of those as some functions of in local coordinates. That as we described before, there'd be some x's, some u's giving coordinates. And then these p j less than or equal to j's, those are the semi-positive coefficients. So the negative grade coefficients are solved for in terms of semi-positive at each point, and of course the coefficients may involve which point we're at. So they may involve the coordinates of the point where we're working, these x and u coordinates. So we finally put it all together and explained from the point of view of a tableau, how do we organize the picture of involution as being a picture about certain equations on integral elements expressed rather naturally the tableau picture as the negative grade coefficients are some functions of position and semi-positive grade coefficients. And that counts out exactly the predicted dimension as, as, as we saw it in the cartan kahler theorem. But it is possible for a non-involutive system to have some additional equations. In fact, it's exactly the failure of involution is that the, um, the semi-positive grade coefficients are not arbitrary. Uh, inv involution is precisely the condition that at least locally you can vary the pj less than or equal to j coefficients, the, the uh, semi-positive coefficients, uh, arbitrarily, at least locally. Because, of course, we're now, we're now invoking the implicit function theorem here, we can't do things globally anymore, but at least locally that would be true. In, th in the next lecture, we're going to try to see how to take this description of a tableau and the semi-positive and, and, and negative grade coefficients and turn them into systems of partial differential equations. And then we should see how to actually prove the cartan kahler theorem.